Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you this morning uh, at Glen Abbey, and um, it's lovely to see so many people here uh, in person, and we're really looking forward uh, to taking time to worship the Lord together, to hear from His Word, and just to enjoy being here. And we're hopeful that our lots of people are watching us on live, live stream this morning. I am told that it's definitely working. I've even been texted some pictures of people sitting in front of their TV screens. So we're being joined by many other people, and we're delighted that you've been able to do that this week. Huge thank you goes out to our tech guys who worked on some problems last week and uh, put together a great online service for us at short notice. We really do appreciate that. This morning, we're continuing um, our series in 1 Peter, A Place to Stand, and Simon Lennox will be coming a little later to open up God's word to us. Today is the second Sunday in November, which is also commonly known as Remembrance Sunday. And we want to take time just at the start of our service to reflect, to remember, and to pray together. We're going to watch a short video now, and then I'm going to come back and pray. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Let's just take time to pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for these words that are trustworthy and true, that our hope is in you. And we do look forward to a redeemed creation. Thank you that you are making all things new. God of new beginnings, we pray for places where conflict has lasted too long, where peacemaking has failed in the face of human pride, greed, and fear. May the old order pass away and a new world come to be in which the fear of violence is history. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. God of healing, we pray for the brokenhearted, those who are scarred by the things they have done or the things that have been done to them. We long for an end to mourning, crying, and pain. 
when every tear shall be wiped away. And may we, your people, learn to be comforters to the comfortless. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. God of peace, we pray for peacemakers, for those who refuse to accept that violence is necessary, whose work is hardly noticed, and who win no medals. We thank you for the vision of a world where swords are beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and no one harms or destroys anyone. Teach us to love peace, we pray. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. God who says, I am making everything new, we pray that you will renew us, give us hope in your future when the world is dark. Give us confidence in your truth when we're tempted to doubt. Give us joy in your presence when we feel we're alone. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. As we come to worship you this morning, to take time to praise you, to allow you to speak into our hearts and lives, we are thankful for the words we find in this psalm. Psalm 121, verses 1 to 8. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The Lord will watch over your life. He will keep you from harm. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. <laughs> okay, let's stand and sing together.
local food bank is a practical way to help those in need and show the love of Christ. When lockdown began in March, this need dramatically increased. As a family, we had time and opportunity to volunteer in the warehouse, stocking shelves or making up food hampers for delivery. In the last six months, Newton Abbey Food Bank has fed over 3,300 people, which is more than the whole of the previous year. These needs are about to increase further in the coming months. Thank you to all of you who already contribute to Food Bank. Anyone wishing to support, there's a special online giving page on the Glen Abbey website and app. While this need is great, we also know that our God is able. Good morning, everybody. It's just so great to be out and to see everybody this morning. And we're just going to spend some time now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to praise and thank you for the opportunity of being able to meet together in person. We want to thank you, Lord, for choosing us to be part of your family. We thank and praise you that we are loved, accepted and forgiven, and that you have brought us into eternal life. Heavenly Father, we are living in very uncertain and unsettling times with the global pandemic and everything else that is going on in the world. But Father, we know that in all this uncertainty that you never change. We know that you are in control, you are sovereign, and that you sit on the throne. Help us to take comfort in these facts and that none of this comes as a surprise to you. We have a God that knows all things and is in control of all things and a God we can trust and a God who is always faithful. We pray for those in authority making difficult decisions at this time. We pray that you would direct them and give them wisdom. But mostly we pray that people would turn to you. Lord, at this time, all our earthly idols are being stripped away. And we pray that through your Holy Spirit, that people would now acknowledge their need of you in their lives. Lord, we give thanks for all of the organizations and volunteers that are working to help in this pandemic. And we give particular thanks for the work of the food banks that are crucial in supporting those in need. Each one of us has a role to play in being lights in this world. And I pray that you would lay in our hearts what you would want that role to be and that we would be obedient to your calling. Lord, we thank you for those working on the front line, particularly in our health service. And we pray that you strengthen them and give them extra perseverance and compassion in these difficult times. Lord, we pray now for those who have been dealing um, with particularly hard times. We pray for those who are suffering the raw pain of grief or have received bad news about health or are living with serious illnesses and don't know what the future holds for them. We particularly pray for Matthew and Emma Best, son and daughter-in-law of Robert and Doreen, who lost their newborn son, Jacob, this week. Lord, this is pain we can't even imagine. Father, we pray that you be their comfort, be their strength, be their peace. Lord, we long to draw close to those who are suffering and our human reaction is to physically give them a hug. And at the minute, we can't do that. But Lord, you understand. So Father, we pray that you put your everlasting arms around all those who are suffering. Hold them close, Lord, so close that they feel your presence and know that you're with them. Lord, we thank you that you are our refuge and strength and our help in times of trouble. And Father, now we, we pray for this morning and we pray now for Simon as he comes to teach us this morning. We pray that you would use Simon um, and your word to speak into each one of us and that we would allow your word to transform us. We pray that as we go about our daily tasks and our daily lives that we would rely on your word and that we would put our hope in you alone. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray all of these things. Amen. Just before Simon comes to speak to us, we're going to sing I Will Wait For You. 
But before we sing, I'm going to read some verses from Psalm 130. There's lots of places in the Bible where we're told to wait upon the Lord, to put in this practice of depending on him, relying on him, being confident that he's in control, trusting in his timing. This is what Psalm 130 says. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. Let's stand and sing this song together. Simon as he comes to speak from your word and you would help us to hear what you have to say. Amen. Good morning to all those who are masked in front of me. I'm not going to see any facial expressions at all for the next 20 minutes or so, but good morning to all those unmasked online. And I hope you brush your teeth this morning because it's going to get pretty stuffy in there. 
And I'm, maybe you're looking at me and wondering why there's this furry animal underneath my nose, and you're hoping, why aren't you wearing a mask as well? But I am sorry, you're going to have to bear with it. This is the month of November, so I hope it's not too much of a distraction as we jump into God's Word here. But one thing the masks and this uh, bizarre moustache symbolizes is that life is full of uncertainties. Even before the coronavirus reached Ireland, uncertainty was and always will be a factor of everyone's life, ranging from the day-to-day, will it be sunny for my socially distanced family gathering outside, and if it's still foggy, you might not even see them if you are doing that, to relationships and work, will I ever get married? Will my marriage ever recover? Will my grades get me to where I want to go next? Where will I find a new job through to health and wellness? What will my scan or test results reveal? Will my loved one recover from illness? Will I grow old with my spouse? And then the reality for many families who are wondering when and where their next meal will come from. We all manage uncertainty differently, and with it comes some profound learning and some opportunity, but if we are all to admit it, the stress, the anxiety, the fear, the pain is real and sometimes overwhelming, and maybe you're feeling that this morning. But imagine, however, on top of these life uncertainties, the UK and Irish governments joined a global coalition believing Christianity is a virus that is ruining today's progressive way of life, and that all who believed in Christ had to abandon their faith or face indefinite expulsion. That meant losing your jobs, your homes, possessions, inheritances, community, and being forced to rebuild your life in an unfamiliar land in a completely different culture. Well, that's exactly what happened to Peter's first century readers. They were treated as cultural outsiders, expelled from Rome, losing everything for believing in Jesus. And I pray that what the Holy Spirit says through Peter for their intense uncertainty all those years ago will also strengthen our hearts for whatever uncertainty and suffering I guarantee a lot of you are experiencing right now behind those masks. So with that heart ready to hear the Spirit, We're in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 12, and God says, and Peter writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. 
Even angels long to look into these things. So incredible words loaded with life-changing truth. And according to the Greek scholars, it's this one long sentence. And my aim this morning is simply to trace the reason Peter gives for why in the midst of suffering and uncertainty, there is a certainty in life on which we can stand. Our eternal security in Christ. For by the grace of God, we have a future certainty, verses three to five, a present certainty, verses six to nine, and a past certainty, verses 10 to 12. That's exactly where I'm going for the next 20. So future certainty. Peter gives his reasons, his readers in verses three to five, three reasons why we today and the people then can be certain of our future existence in heaven. Here they are. Number one, God's mercy. Verse three, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given. In other words, despite all the ways in which humanity has messed up, and we have, it was and still is God's gracious plan to give us eternal life. And since it is a gift, it is therefore not something anyone can earn. It's not something anyone deserves. It's not contingent upon passing some sort of moral life test. We simply need to receive this gift by faith, believing and trusting in Jesus who suffered immensely for that gift we can have today. How can we be sure? It is based on God's unchanging character, his mercy. And so we rejoice with Peter in this opening line, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, for it is in Christ that God's mercy is shown, given, and received by us. That brings me to reason two Peter gives. God's resurrection. He, God, has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, Peter says, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Here's another reminder. There is no hope, no life after death, no eternal security, no salvation, no relationship with God, no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus. And thanks be to the Holy Spirit and many Christian and non-Christian historians, scientists, and theologians, we can actually peruse the overwhelming evidence for Christ's resurrection as told in Scripture, meaning the only likely explanation is that it's true and that demands a response. And as one church leader once said, even if you still don't believe it is true, you should want it to be. Because Christ's resurrection means death is not the end. For upon placing our trust in Christ, we immediately receive God's gift of spiritual birth, which is being transformed from a creature of God. He made us, he designed us, who is spiritually dead without hope, to a child of God who is spiritually alive with incredible hope. And according to Peter, we are born into two things, a living hope, living because as long as Christ is alive, and he is, our hope in him is alive today and works through us into where God has placed us. And secondly, we are born into an inheritance. Now, I'd love to talk about that for hours and dream about it and look across scripture, but whatever that ends up being as we continue to serve and trust and explore God in the next life, it means this, that what Christ has planned for us cannot be stolen, destroyed, or lose value like everything else in this world. It is guaranteed we are legitimate heirs. We are children of God. 
So the resurrection, God's mercy, God's resurrection, and thirdly, God's power. Peter says, through faith, we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I love the reality here of God our Father shielding, guarding, and watching over us. And that does not mean, as we'll see shortly, we will not face suffering of all kinds. But what it does mean, again, and we sang this in all the songs so far, that we, because we are justified by faith alone in Christ, by His grace, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing eternal life. That means, as you sit here, as you listen, that nothing and no one and nothing you've done can separate us from the love of God, nor pluck us from His protective sovereign hand, nor stop us experience the final stage of salvation when Christ returns. So there we have it. Three reasons why we can be certain of our eternal security in Christ. God's mercy, it's based on that. God's re resurrection, that enables it, and his power that continues with us today. What a message to people who have lost everything. And it's a challenge for us today because this is not just a future event to look forward to, nor a, a nice little thought to help us feel good when we're down. This means that we're actually citizens of heaven. And by definition, we are cultural outsiders. Planet Earth is not our home. And we're not facing social alienation for the name of Christ like Peter's readers, nor like many people in the world today, especially in Muslim-dominated countries, facing that alienation, but the challenge for us as cultural outsiders in Northern Ireland is quite different. Because it's all too easy for our hopes, dreams, choices, and activities to be shaped and homogenized by this society, by Northern Ireland's culture, and not the society and culture of God's kingdom. That's something to think about and that's a challenge to keep in mind for where Peter takes us next. That future certainty, keep it in mind. Let's go into the present certainty. This is verses six to nine. And Peter, Peter's very honest. He knows that they're greatly rejoicing in this. And he knows that the same faith that gives us eternal security is the very same faith causing the suffering his readers are facing. And he knows that very well from personal experience because verses six to nine really hit home for Peter as it raises two hard realities that challenged his own faith and maybe challenge your faith today. One is this, faith in suffering and secondly, faith without sight verses six to seven, faith and suffering. For Peter, if you remember from the Gospels, he had the audacity to confront the Lord Jesus himself by rejecting that the suffering and death was to be the way of the Messiah. He just didn't get it. And in faith without sight, we also remember Peter, even though he was physically with Jesus, he heard his teachings live, he witnessed his miracles, he was there for the transfiguration, and yet he succumbed to the pressure and fear of persecution by denying him. That makes Peter the perfect person to speak now into this situation of the readers and to us today. So firstly, faith with suffering, verses six to seven, and all this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Another loaded verse, but I wanna draw three insights about suffering, and we're gonna hear a lot more throughout the whole series. First one's this. Suffering is temporary. That's the first thing 
that Peter does to reassure his readers. Suffering of all kinds is just for now, just for a little while in this life until Christ returns. Now, that doesn't take away the pain, but it does make it that little bit more bearable. Secondly, suffering is diverse. He says, suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And there's so many types. There's personal suffering of losing a job, of losing things, a loved one, or the consequences of personal failure. There's suffering due to the injustices of the world, such as war, and that's why we're remembering today all those who have sacrificed their lives, suffering due to the brokenness of nature, suffering for insisting and doing what is right, suffering for the name of Jesus, suffering that comes with Christian leadership, which the rest of the letter picks up. So it's temporary, it is diverse, and thirdly, suffering is refining. Reality is that no genuine faith will live without suffering in this world. Christians have known this from the beginning, and all of us, sooner or later, will find out that it costs something to be a Christian. And when that does happen, that general suffering can challenge our trust in the faith, the doctrines, the gospel, the word of God, or it can even challenge whether we will continue to trust God or not and identify with him. We've got to expect suffering in this world. Secondly, let's remember, and this was what my heart needed to remember as I read this, genuine faith is not perfect faith. God is is not playing games with our lives here, like setting up some sort of obstacle course or some sort of entrance exam before he lets us into heaven. And the fact that if your faith is being tested, that is not failure nor if you're feeling distress in your testing, that is not, does not mean your faith is weak, and nor does it mean that you have to get things right all the time, because let's remember, Jesus prayed for Peter's faith that it might not fail, but soon after, he denied him. Jesus prayed that, and he prays that for us, that Peter would return to him again, know his grace and forgiveness again and continue in his amazing hope. And precisely why suffering of all its kinds hits us in God's sovereignty, I cannot answer. But according to Peter, in these verses, we will know what it does to your faith. Genuine faith is not perfect. Genuine faith will be tested. So genuine faith is tested faith. And Peter uses the example of gold, which is one of the most precious metals. And although fire purifies it and leaves the proven genuine gold after it's been through the fire, it will not last beyond this life. But take our suffering in this life add on our faith. Our faith will not be destroyed by suffering, but what will be removed is some of the dross. Maybe your faith, maybe the coronavirus really tested us all. Is your faith just based on peer pressure? Is it just based on tradition? Is it just based on feeling? Is it wrapped up with all sorts of false teaching? Or is it based on a personal experience with Christ? And Peter goes on as well to explain that unlike gold, when all is said and done, it will be our faith in Christ that will be left when he returns. That makes it the most precious thing in your life. Nothing else compares. So that's the first challenge that Peter faced and his readers faced, faith in suffering. The second is faith without sight. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now again, Peter's honesty comes through. He understands how suffering or the possibility of suffering 
could easily persuade someone to give up following someone they've never actually seen before. Have you ever thought about that? We are following someone we have never actually seen before. And of course, it was easy for Peter, was it? He talked with Jesus, ate with him, walked, touched him, saw him with his own two eyes, witnessed his crucifixion, his resurrection, and ascension. Of course, it was easy for him. But it was the Lord Jesus, and this is probably one of the most profound insights that I discovered when reading this. It was the Lord Jesus in his resurrected body who said to Peter and his disciples in John 20, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In other words, learning to trust Christ in this life for the next is actually a deliberate part of our spiritual experience. Learning to trust Christ. Now, if I had time, I would love to take that argument further that seeing is just believing. Because we're like Peter's listeners. We're following Christ without seeing him. Does that make us crazy? Does that make this one big religious feel-good fantasy? Is there any evidence? Is this, as a friend recently claimed to me, just blind faith? No. There is so much evidence and the categories of evidence I would jump to in a conversation with somebody and trying to be really normal and natural when I do this is to jump into history related to the biblical accounts, church history, as well as general human history. How do you answer for how we have cyclically messed things up? We're not getting it right or a creation, my personal experience of it, or what science tells us about it, or even personal experience through the Holy Spirit. Because the reality is, there's evidence that Jesus Christ is real that only comes when you actually trust him and experience him for yourself. That's this love, even though we haven't seen him, that's this inexpressible joy that we have within us because it's real to us. We use our mind, we, in our hearts it's real, and our experience of this life, he is real. And even when you hear stories of people in the worst suffering, who have a glowing, genuine faith, that cannot be ignored. But the final piece that I would go to, number four, is scripture, and that's how Peter finishes this section of this first letter. He reminds people that the certainty of our faith is found in the certainty and trustworthiness of Scripture, pointing them to what the prophets predicted by the Holy Spirit and what the preachers taught through the gospel in the Word today by the Holy Spirit. And there's lots of insights in those final verses, but here's the thing. Yes, Peter's readers, and yes, we didn't and haven't seen Jesus Christ physically ourselves, but perhaps the witness of Scripture, which continues to stand the test of time, is an even more powerful witness than the transfiguration itself. Learning to trust Christ requires that we all individually and collectively keep examining the Bible, especially to prepare for that time when we might be called to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ, and we will need something for our souls to grab onto when the time comes to tell us that Christ is still the Messiah. And so, as believers, as we go out here and leave, a challenge again to keep examining the scriptures, keep it central, and if you don't know the Lord, that's where you've got to get to. Read it for yourself. Grab a hold of John. Use a resource called Word One to One. Read it with a friend and discover it for yourself. But in conclusion, I must wrap up this loaded one sentence section of First Peter by saying this. To face the uncertainties of life, we've got to start tomorrow and every day with our certainties in 
Christ. And Peter gives a very strong case why you can be certain of your eternal security today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great mercy, your amazing grace, your deep, deep love. We know that because we see Christ who died for us, suffered immeasurably, but he rose again, and that means we have hope. That means our future is certain. That means in the present now, we have security, and we know that that's all anchored in that past event when he rose from the dead. So I pray, Lord, that these words would teach us, encourage us, inspire us to keep going, to keep learning, to keep trusting in you. In his name we pray, amen. Let's stand to sing this last song, Ancient of Days.
have your seats. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today and for everyone online. I hope uh, that that's all worked well for you as well. Um, as we have in the, when we've had our in-person gatherings, can I encourage you just to stay in your seats? The ushers will uh, tell you when to leave and to exit the building, which will be by the fire escape on your left as you leave. There's a hand sanitizer there to use on the wall if you want to. And can I again remind you that as you go outside, um, just to look after your social distancing and to, to get off site as quickly as possible, I'll be a good witness to your neighbours as well. We look forward to seeing you again either next week or in the weeks that lie ahead. Thanks for being with us.